Hi, I'm Bob Tessier, administrator of the Facebook group page Remembering Albion, Rhode Island, and developer of this presentation, which was originally developed for a lecture of the Blackstone Valley Historical Society on December 6, 2015. The narrated presentation that you are about to view is intended primarily for my group members who were unable to attend the December presentation, but I welcome all others who may have an interest in the early years of Albion. Thank you. When thinking about Albion, many people probably visualize a small village populated by French Canadians, almost all of whom are Catholic, and who spent most of their life working in the cotton mill. If we're talking about the years after 1822, most of that would be true. But for the years prior to 1822, we find a vastly different population with a different religion and occupation. This presentation reflects the findings of my research into one of the families that settled in the Albion District. With the support of the Blackstone Valley Historical Society and a grant from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, I spent the last year researching the land transactions, probate records, and other vital records of the Lapham family to develop a monograph that reflects my findings and presents a picture of the Lapham family as they lived in the Albion district from 1730 to 1886. In association with the research on the Lapham family, the monograph also touches upon some of the Lapham neighbors through those years. Due to the requirements of the grant, as well as nuisances such as not enough time and not enough money, the research was limited to one year. While I was able to visit several significant archives while traveling from my home in Maryland, time did not allow me to visit other archives that would have no doubt provided useful background information. Despite these restrictions, I have written a monograph called Anatomy of a Village the influence of the Lapham family on the development of Albion, Rhode Island, that I believe presents historical data about Albion that has not previously been compiled in this manner. Copies of the monograph have been given to the Historical Society for its library, and a copy also provided for the Lincoln Public Library for its local history shelf. An online version will also be available at my Albion website in January. I would especially like to thank the Blackstone Valley Historical Society for their support of my project and for allowing me the opportunity to share some of my findings with you. I also want to applaud the officers and board of the Historical Society for agreeing to sponsor Ken Postle's restoration efforts on our local historical cemeteries. Such a dedicated effort, thank you. Funding for this project was provided in part by a grant from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, which seeds, supports, and strengthens public history, cultural heritage, civic education, and community engagement by and for all Rhode Islanders. When my grandfather passed away when I was nine years old, he left behind a number of scrapbooks of old newspaper clippings that my grandmother let me browse through. Among those scrapbooks was one that contained a number of articles about events in Albion, including a series of 11 articles that appeared in the Massacre called in 1948, written by Norman Chamberlain on the occasion of what he claimed was the 200th anniversary of the founding of Albion. I have held on to those articles, intrigued by the early history that was chronicled there. Back a few years ago now, I looked for a way to share this information, as well as the random other articles my grandfather left behind. With the advent of Facebook, I was able to begin a group called Remembering Albion, Rhode Island, with the intent to share the information that I had, and to encourage others to share similar information. Our group is now approaching 300 members, young and older. 
As I was inputting the Winsaka Call articles on the history of Albion, it suddenly occurred to me that what Chamberlain had reported about the founding of Albion and the people involved was not referenced to any primary sources. In doing some preliminary research to try to find such references in the various histories of Rhode Island, I discovered that what was usually reported about Albion began with the establishment of the mill in 1822. Anything written about Albion after 1948 simply repeated what Chamberlain had written. And so it was that I began this project to verify or else contradict the only written account of the early history of Albion. Among the claims made by Chamberlain that I was interested in investigating were the following. Was Augustus Lapham one of the first white men to penetrate the wilderness that was Albion? Did Augustus Lapham purchase the land that comprised Albion Village and beyond? Did he purchase the land from the Nipmucks? Were the Laphams and Baloos the first pioneers? Was Albion first known as Monticello? And finally, is the house that stands at the Kirkbury Country Club the first house that was built in Albion? As I completed about half of my research, I discovered an article written by Ted Bishop in 1936 on the occasion of Rhode Island's tercentenary, I put forth all the claims that Chamberlain had made in his 1948 series, except for the claim about the first house to be built in Albion. Ted Bishop was the son of James Bishop, station master at the Albion train depot for the New York and New Haven Railroad. Mr. Bishop was regarded as the unofficial historian of Albion and no doubt had related many stories to Ted and his siblings through the years. This photo of Mr. Bishop and Ted was taken at their home in Albion around 1914. Yet the fundamental issue remained. What were these claims based on? So, were the Laphams and Baloos the first pioneers in the Albion district? Chamberlain probably was right in saying that we don't know for sure who the first pioneers were. Genealogical sources show that James Ballou had settled in the area probably as early as 1683. His first homestead would have been on land south of the present Albion Road but it is said that he acquired several thousand acres more during his lifetime. His descendants continued to live in the area for many years. On the other hand, both genealogical and land records show that the first Lapham, Thomas Lapham, did not settle in the Albion district until 1730. He purchased his land from William Gully and not from the Nitmucks. Augustus Lapham was, in fact, the son of Thomas Lapham, born in 1750. From the beginning of settlement in the Albion district around 1683 until the establishment of the cotton mill in 1822, the area had no name. After the town of Smithfield was chartered in 1731, it simply was identified as being in Smithfield. However, Steer in his book of 1881 claims that for several years prior to 1822, the Albion area had been called Monticello. However, he does not indicate the source for this assertion. Chamberlain repeated this claim in his newspaper series. 
In examining the hundreds of deeds of the era, I have discovered only one reference to Monticello. This reference is contained in a deed from the heirs of Samuel Hill, dated September 27, 1833, that granted a certain tract of land to Joseph Almy and John Parker. In describing the boundaries of the property conveyed, reference is made to land of the, quote, Monticello Manufacturing Company. This reference is undoubtedly to the Albion Manufacturing Company, the name by which other documents had referred to it since its establishment in 1822. Samuel Hill Jr. had been one of the original purchases of the land that became the Albion Manufacturing Company. An additional land had been purchased from his father, Samuel Hill Sr. Both father and son were house rights, living in the time of Thomas Jefferson. It is likely that they would have known about the Monticello estate in Virginia. Given the facts that one of the meanings of Monticello is hill, and that the hills were house rights, it might not be too far-fetched to suggest that Samuel Hill was responsible for initiating the Monticello appellation to his estate, and that his son Samuel may have perhaps named the manufacturing company in its infancy. That the name would continue to be applied in 1833 by the Hill family suggests to me a familial attachment or loyalty that transcended the realities of the time and cling to a remnant of the estate that once was. For instance, the Providence Patriot on November 10, 1824, referred to the, quote, Albion Mill in discussing the road of the Smithfield Turnpike. In another instance, the Rhode Island American, dated April 17, 1827, reported the marriage of Peleg Sweet and Sarah Langley at the, quote, Albion factory. The first mention of the Albion village that I was able to discover was a death notice for Mrs. Wealthy Ann Nichols that appeared in the Providence Patriot on May 7, 1828. My point is that as of this writing, it is more likely that Monticello was the name applied to the Hill Estate and not to the mill village that began to be established. So what have we learned? Was Augustus Lapham one of the first white men to penetrate the wilderness that was Albion? No. He would not be born until 1750, decades after the first settlers arrived. Did Augustus Lapham purchase the land that comprised Albion Village and beyond? And did he purchase the land from the Nipmucks? The answer is no on both counts. The property was part of the land owned by William Gully, who sold the property to Thomas Lapham, Augustus's father. Were the Laphams and Ballews the first pioneers? Perhaps James Ballew, who settled around 1683, may be considered a pioneer, but certainly not the Laphams, who did not settle there until 1730. And was Albion first known as Monticello? Perhaps, but primary sources do not support this name for the village. And finally, is the house that stands at the Kirkbrae Country Club the first house that was built in Albion? The answer is no. As I mentioned, it's recorded that William Gully had settled in the area before 1730. And owned hundreds of acres. I was not able to discover with certainty from whom he had purchased his property, but it's very probable that a land purchase that Gully had made with John Inman in 1726 
and included the land that Gully had sold to Lapham. The deed to Lapham from Gully indicated that the property included a dwelling and other buildings. From another deed, we know that the dwelling had been there since at least 1728. Given also that James Ballou had settled in the area around 1683, the claim by Chamberlain that the so-called Lapham House built in 1748 was the first house in Albion is shown to be unsupported by the facts. From the Lapham deed, we also learn that Daniel Jenks owned land that abutted the property. Jenks was another who had lived in the area prior to 1730. His land purchases were also extensive. Both Jenks and Gully deserve further study. The map you see indicates the approximate locations of the lands that Gully and Jenks owned. Gully had the greater acreage in Albion, however. The brown line is the current Old River Road. In the early deeds, its reference is simply the highway or the highway that leads to the furnace, which would have meant Manville. It soon became known as the East Road, although it runs north and south. I haven't found any explanation, but my guess is that it was so-called because it was the main highway in the eastern part of the town. Over time, it was also called the River Road, and after the village was established, the Back Road. So we ask, who were the Laphams? For our purposes, they were six generations that saw the value of land ownership and engaged in it throughout their lifetimes. The last five generations were particularly involved in land transactions in the Albion vicinity. And with the exception of one of the sons in the sixth generation, all the Laphams were Quakers. We begin with the first of the Laphams to emigrate to Rhode Island, namely John Lapham, who arrived around 1660. A devoted Quaker, he was unmarried, 25 years old, and had worked as a weaver, probably in the cloth trade in his hometown of Devon, England. John Lapham continued his devotion to Quaker principles while in Providence, and he soon became a part of the growing influence of the Quakers in Rhode Island's government. He gained a significant measure of influence with his marriage to Mary Mann in 1673, the daughter of one of the proprietors of Providence, William Mann. In the same year, he was chosen as one of four deputies to represent Providence in the General Assembly. In 1675, he was made a constable at Providence. As King Philip's War escalated in 1676, Lapham and his family fled to the safety of Newport. In March of 1676, their house was one of a countless number burned by the Indians when they stormed into Providence. Lapham and his family did not return to Providence, but remained in Newport until sometime between 1680 and 1682, when they moved to Dartmouth, Massachusetts. They left the relative safety of Newport to settle in an area where Quakers were just beginning to assemble, and who were then still under intolerant Puritan laws which subjected them to possible imprisonment, fines, whippings, and banishment. We don't know the reason why the Laphams left Newport, but it is known that good farming land was becoming scarce in the Newport area at that time. Lapham continued to acquire land while in Dartmouth, 
as well as the man lands in Providence through his wife's inheritance. It's reported that he had acquired several hundred acres in Providence plantations, though none of it appears to have been in the Albion vicinity. When Lapham died in 1710, he had deeded or bequeathed all of his land in Providence and Dothmer to his two surviving sons, John Jr. and Nicholas, except for a four-acre lot on Fox Hill in Providence that had been deeded to his daughter Mary, wife of Charles Dyer of Newport. John Lapham Jr. was born in Newport. He married his wife, Mary Russell, in Dartmouth in 1700. They had 14 children, all of whom lived to adulthood, a rarity in those days. While he had obtained a considerable amount of land from his father, he continued to expand his own land holdings in Dartmouth and sell off his Providence properties. Yet the prospect of inheriting their father's lands did not persuade the five sons to remain in Dartmouth, preferring instead to see what Smithfield could offer them. John Lapham Jr. certainly tried to keep some of his boys in Dartmouth, offering his oldest son John 100 acres and his youngest son Joshua 130 acres. While it did succeed in keeping Joshua around for several years, Son John only stayed for another 18 months. By 1752, all five boys had relocated to Smithfield, four of whom settled in the Albion vicinity. It doesn't seem as if John Lapham Jr. held any animosity for his sons due to their leaving Dartmouth. In fact, he later obtained land in the Albion vicinity that he sold to some of his sons. A few years after the death of his wife Mary in 1752, Lapham bought land in the Albion vicinity from his son Thomas and relocated there. Two years later, he married the widow Elizabeth Hanson Buxton in Smithfield. In 1758, he sold the land in the Albion vicinity. Nothing further is known about John Lapham Jr. after 1758. His brother Nicholas also continued to expand his land holdings in Dartmouth, but never ventured into the Albion vicinity. No more need be said about Nicholas. While John Lapham III may be the older brother, I start here with Thomas Lapham who was the first of the Laphams to settle in the Albion vicinity. Thomas was born in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, and married Abigail Wilbur in Dartmouth in 1729. They had nine children, six of whom lived to adulthood, they being three girls and three boys. Thomas made the first purchase of land by a Lapham in the Albion vicinity on June 5th, 1730. Thomas purchased 100 acres from William Gully for 300 pounds. The first page of the original deed is shown on the screen. Let me read how the property is described. It may give you an idea of the difficulty in trying to determine accurate property lines in those days. I quote, a certain tract or parcel of land containing by estimation 100 acres more or less toward the northwardly part thereof, and in or near to those woods called Lorquisset, on the southwardly corner to a stake and stones, and from thence range it northwardly to a black oak tree marked, and range it northeasterly to a stake and heap of stones, then range it still northeasterly to a green oak tree marked, standing on the western bank of Pawtucket River, that is the Blackstone River, 
and range it from it upstream of said river, adjoining to it a small black oak tree, standing some considerable distance above the old mill brook on the bank of said river, and range it from thence westwardly to a small walnut tree marked, standing on the east side of the highway, and range it from thence with said highway and adjoining to it to the first mentioned stake and stones. The said land is budded on the south and on the east with the land of Daniel Jenks and the above said river, and on the north with the land of the above said William Gully, and on the west with said highway. With the dwelling house standing thereon and other buildings, fencing, orchards, meadows, pastures, groves. Unquote. We can see the approximate location of Thomas's property on the map. It took in all of the present Kirkbury property, right down to Albion Village and the mill. And by the end of 1730, Thomas's father had also purchased property in the Albion vicinity, buying 150 acres from Daniel Jenks that spanned the current Route 116. Thomas Lapham involved himself in commercial and civic activities for much of his adult life in Smithfield. For several years, he had shares in an iron mill on the Blackstone River, known by various names such as the Bloomery, the Refinery, the Woonsocket Iron Mill, or the Old Forge. He is also said to have had an association with the Unity Furnace and the Unity Forge on the west side of the Blackstone River in what is now Manville and Cumberland. He reportedly also carried on large farming operations. His uncle Nicholas granted him power of attorney in 1745 to collect debts owed and to sell off his property in Rhode Island, a task that would take Thomas 10 years to complete. Thomas's association with the court led him to be deputy to the general court almost continuously from 1747 to 1752. He also served as judge of the Court of Common Pleas for a number of years. Both courts had jurisdiction over civil and criminal matters. Thomas was also much involved in the buying and selling of land having taken part in 27 separate transactions between 1730 and 1773. Despite his enterprises and civic duties, however, Thomas found time to be involved in the organization of the Smithfield Lower Meeting, in which he became clerk and later an elder. When he died, Thomas bequeathed a small piece of land in Gloucester to his daughter Bathsheba, and the rest of his homestead in the Albion vicinity to his son Augustus. Thomas had previously sold part of his estate in the Albion vicinity to his sons Thomas Jr. and Augustus. No land in the Albion vicinity had been left to his son Jethro, who had long ago been settled in Gloucester. Born in Dartmouth, John Lapham III was the second brother to settle in the Albion vicinity. He married Desire Holland in Dartmouth in 1725 and was initially persuaded to remain in Dartmouth after his brother Thomas had gone to Smithfield in 1731. The persuasion was caused, as we will remember, by a 100-acre property from his father which John returned late in 1732 and moved to Smithfield, settling in the Albion vicinity on land that his father owned there. John and his family remained in the Albion area for only a dozen years, selling his estate to his brother Thomas, 
and moving to a Quaker settlement at Nine Partners in New York State. So by the end of 1732, we note that John Lapham Jr., or two on the map, has purchased land north of his son Thomas's land, and that Thomas's brother John, or three on the map, has purchased land south of Thomas's property and west of his father's property. Joseph Lapham was born in Dartmouth. He purchased land from his father in 1733, land that would have included portions of Mussy Brook. He married Mary Ballou in Smithfield in 1734, and six of their nine children lived to adulthood. He sold his land to his brother Joshua in 1752 and moved to Cumberland. So at the end of 1733, we see that John Lapham Jr. has sold all his remaining land in the Albion vicinity, namely land in the north to his son Joseph, and land along the current route 116 to his son John III. Joshua Lapham was born in Dartmouth, the youngest brother. He married Hannah Shearman in Smithfield in 1747, leading one to believe that perhaps Joshua had been living with one of his brothers. Yet we know that his father deeded him 130 acres in Dartmouth the same year, probably after his marriage to Hannah, and that they took up residence on that property. Nevertheless, in 1752, he bought his brother Joseph's farm in the Albion vicinity and moved his family there. He purchased additional land from his brothers in 1756 and 1758, increasing his total acreage to about 126 acres. He continued to farm until 1769 when he sold his land and moved to East Hoosick, Massachusetts. Joshua was one of the first organizers of the Society of Friends there, and the site of his home is marked by a tablet erected in 1924. In 1744, Thomas Lapham purchased the 96-acre farm of his brother, John III, bordering along the current Route 116. In 1747, Thomas purchased a 140-acre lot on the western side of the East Road, extending his acreage. He sold 17 acres of the northern part of this lot to William Gully. His southern neighbor was now Samuel Ballou, who had extended his holdings northward with the purchase of John Phillips' property. Lapham and Ballou had also exchanged some small lots along their border in 1748. Benjamin Lapham was born in Dartmouth. He married Lydia Ballou in Smithfield in 1742 and lived on a farm that his father-in-law, Samuel Ballou, owned. Benjamin purchased this farm in 1744. It wasn't located in the Albion vicinity, but in an area known as the Island Woods, which appears to be near the southeastern boundary of North Smithfield. His wife Lydia and two of their three children sadly died within days of each other in 1751. He remarried in 1752 with Mary Mann, 
with whom he had ten children. He sold all of his land in 1770 and joined his brother Joshua in East Husik. He and Joshua acquired a great deal of land there. His home is also marked by a memorial tablet. Thomas Lapham Jr. was born in Smithfield. He married Mary Harris in Smithfield in 1761. In 1762, his father gave him a lot of about 60 acres, part of the 140-acre lot that Thomas Sr. had purchased in 1747. When Thomas Jr. died in 1788, he divided the property among five of his children but left the care and management of the estate to his son, David. David, however, soon contracted tuberculosis and in 1790 sold his share of the estate to his uncle Augustus, Thomas Jr.'s brother, one month before David died. In 1754, Thomas Lapham sold a 30-acre lot to his father, John Jr., that abutted Joshua Lapham's property. John Jr. sold the lot to Joshua in 1758. So at the end of 1762, the landscape has changed slightly, with Thomas Lapham Jr. now occupying what was the southern portion of his father's property west of the East Road. Augustus Lapham was born in Smithfield. His father gave him 100 acres of the northern part of his homestead farm in 1769. Augustus married Mary Scott in Providence in 1775. They had nine children, five of whom lived to adulthood. By 1778, according to Smithfield tax records, he is said to have owned 166 acres and seems to have been quite prosperous. For example, he is reported as having had nine cows, two oxen, 11 horned cattle, 24 sheep and or goats, and 10 swine. As we learned earlier, his father, Thomas Lapham, had left him the remainder of his homestead farm when he died in 1779. Augustus sold his estate in 1790 to Samuel Clark for 900 pounds, land that was to become the beginning of the Albion Mill, Albion Village, St. Ambrose Parish, and the Kirkbury Country Club. Soon after this sale, Augustus began to buy up the shares in his brother Thomas Lapham Jr.'s estate from his nieces and nephews. He would not obtain clear title for nine years, however. In 1791, Augustus purchased 189 acres from William Gully Jr., land which had been part of the vast land holdings of William Gully, land which was for the most part north of Mussy Brook. When Augustus died in 1828, his obituary in the Providence Patriot read in part that he had been a worthy member of the Society of Friends from his youth. He left his estate to his son David. We will recall that Joshua Lapham sold his land in 1769 and moved to Massachusetts. This land was sold to James Mussey and Caleb King. We also see the gift of land to Augustus Lapham, as well as changes in the Ballou land ownership after the death of Samuel Ballou.
By the end of 1779, as we had heard, Thomas Lapham had died and his son Augustus had inherited his estate. By the end of 1799, as we've heard, Thomas Lapham Jr. had died, and his brother Augustus had obtained all the rights of his estate. Augustus sold 170 acres to Samuel Clark in 1790, and purchased 189 acres from William Gully Jr. in 1791 that becoming his homestead estate. By the end of 1812, Augustus Lapham had sold an eight acre lot to his son Amos. Amos would resell it to his father in 1817. David Lapham was born in Smithfield and married Lydia Maury in 1807. They had eight children, six of whom lived to adulthood. David joined the Smithfield Town Council in the Court of Probate in June 1827, and he last appears in October 1830. As we have previously heard, he inherited his father Augustus's estate in 1828. He agreed to sell part of the estate to Thomas Mann in 1829, but David became terminally ill and was not able to officially acknowledge the sale before he died in 1831. A court later ruled that the sale could go through. When David died, he left his estate to be shared among his wife and two sons, Maureen and Scott. The estate consisted of about 95 acres on the east side of the East Road and about 105 acres on the west side and spanned a portion of the Mussy Brook. Here is the extent of the estate that David Lapham left to his family after the approved sale of about 128 acres of the estate to Thomas Mann. As can be seen, the estate extended on both sides of what is now Old River Road. Note where the property meets the curve on Old River Road. On this Google Earth map of the Mussy Brook area, I've highlighted the curve upon which the David Lapham estate abutted to give you a visual of where this estate was located. As you can see, it was located northwest of the village of Albion and strides the Manville Albion boundary. Up until now, land ownership among Lapham family members had been fairly simple and straightforward. With David Lapham's sudden demise, the land ownership situation became more complex. While we have been looking at individuals within the family until now, the last generation needs to be looked at more as a whole, considering how interrelated their lands became. Mori, Eliza, Sarah, and Scott were all born in Smithfield. Mori married Sarah Whitaker in 1831. Since she was a Baptist, it is likely that Mori was cast out of the Society of Friends. They had 11 children, seven of whom lived to adulthood. Eliza and Sarah never married. Scott married Cynthia Martha Whitaker. The sister of his brother Maury's wife around 1837. They had three children, one of whom died young.
Lydia Mowry and her children took no immediate action following David Lapham's death to divide the estate. It wasn't until April of 1838 that a petition for partition was made to the probate court. The court appointed a commission to propose a partition to the court, which was accepted in April 1839. Lots were set off to Lydia, Maury, and her two sons, Maury and Scott. The result is as you see displayed on the screen. The brown area was allocated to Lydia Maury, the green area to Maury Lapham, and the yellow area to Scott Lapham. So at the end of 1840, the landscape would have looked like this. According to the terms of the 1839 petition, Maury and Scott were to have equal shares in the lot shown as the notch within lot L1, land that had been allotted to Lydia Maury. This lot contained the one-story section of the family dwelling. A newer two-story section lay on Lydia Maury's lot L1 and she was allowed to keep that section. In 1841, Maury and Scott agreed to a division of this lot and the one-story dwelling. Maury obtained the east part of the lot, which included the two east rooms and closet on the first floor, the north room upstairs, which was presumably the attic, and the east part of the cellar. Scott obtained the west part and south part of the attic. Did they actually live there? Who knows? But if not, why go to this trouble? In 1847, Scott Lapham sold his share of the lot to Thomas B. Smith, which was curious in that now the house would be divided between Maury and a stranger. However, Smith sold it to Maury Lapham in 1851, giving Maury full possession of the lot and the one-story dwelling. In April 1846, Scott Lapham quit claimed his 45-acre lot, marked S1, to his sister Sarah. Records indicate that he and his family moved to Cumberland. In June and December 1846, respectively, Maury and Sarah Lapham sold about eight acres each to the Providence and Worcester Railroad Company. This is the area shown in gray. It included an eight-foot section along the river that was the towpath for the Blackstone Canal. In June 1847, Sarah, Lydia, Eliza, and Scott Lapham sold all their rights to the Lapham lots to Thomas B. Smith, who negotiated a mortgage loan with them. The sale excluded the land that had been sold to the railroad. In May 1848, Scott and Eliza sold their rights in the mortgage to Sarah. A few months later, Sarah took Smith to court for non-payment of his mortgage loan. While this court opinion was being deliberated, Smith took the Laphams to court 
for refusal to discuss partition of the half shares in the lands he had purchased in 1847, and for loss of rental revenue and other profits. Whereas the Laphams argued otherwise, the court ruled in Smith's favor and ordered a commission to petition the property. The result is as seen here, showing in green the property that Smith was allotted. No ruling was made on the income allegedly lost. As to the mortgage that had not been repaid, the court ruled in Sarah's favor and Smith was ordered to pay. The mortgage was discharged in February 1850. In March 1853, Lydia Maury released her dower rights to Maury Lapham, effectively giving him possession of all the remaining Lapham property. Maury took out a couple of mortgages over the next few years, obviously to pay off current debts, which he always managed to repay. By the beginning of 1856, Maury's land holdings looked like the pink lots in the map in the upper left. In September 1856, Maury exchanged a part of his eastern lot with the Albion Company for the land formerly owned by Thomas B. Smith that Smith had sold to the Albion Company in 1853. This is the area shown in yellow on the upper map. At the end of 1856, then, Maury's holdings were as shown in pink on the lower map. The land that the Albion Company had purchased from Maury was to be used for the new road from Albion to Manville, the current New River Road. In the deed to the Albion Company, it was stated that the company could drain water from Mussy Brook four-sevenths of the time and could cross onto Maury's land at all times to keep the waterway clear. Maury Lapham continued to obtain several mortgages over the years to pay off his debts and repaid them. By 1860, the value of his estate was said to be $4,000. In March 1861, he took out what would be his last mortgage with Fenner Maury for $300. In April 1868, Maury was one of three chosen to survey, bound, and mark a highway from the East Road to the village of Albion in what would become School Street. By 1880, it appears that his wife had left him to live with her daughter in Woonsocket. After she died in 1882, Maury's children became concerned that Maury was unable to manage his estate. They petitioned the probate court in 1883 to appoint a guardian for Maury and his estate. Maury failed to appear for the hearing and a guardian was appointed. The Guardian's inventory found that Maury had little more than a bed and table and chairs, although he did have 66 and 7 eighths cords of wood, which the Guardian immediately sold. The Guardian resigned after a year, and the children sought to have another Guardian appointed. This time, Maury appeared at the hearing and succeeded in making his own case. By 1885, Maury had abandoned the farm and had taken up residence as a boarder in Manville. In 1886, he sold all of his real estate, estimated at 150 acres, to the Handys of Manville. The final deed is as you see here. The Handys used part of the land north of Mussy Brook to erect the Contractsville Mills, which illustrations are included here courtesy of Danny Bethel.
Mowry's wife Sarah had died on January 20, 1882, probably while still living with her daughter in Woonsocket. Mowry Lapton died on October 11, 1886, effectively ending an era that had endured for 156 years. And despite the apparent separation from Sarah, both are seen to be buried together in the Whitaker Mowry lot on Sales Hill Road. In summary, then, we can say with certainty that the majority of the Laphams had been devoted Quakers and leading figures in the Society of Friends. Many had also been civically engaged at both the state and local level. They recognized early the value of land ownership and negotiated hundreds of transactions, small and large. They were stewards of Muzzy Brook for many years and made possible the eventual establishment of the Albion Mill and the Albion Village through the sale of land to Samuel Clark. The Laphams have been virtually unknown in the history of Albion, and I hope that I have been able to successfully share something of who they were and what they did with you all. Thank you. To learn more about the history of Albion, please see my website at www.tellmeaboutalbionrhodeisland.com.